So we're actually at quorum, and it's even a little after seven. So we should probably call this meeting to order, right? At uh, what, 7.02. Um, first order of business is additions and corrections to the agenda. Um, I have one. Does anybody else have anything we need to change on the agenda? No? Okay. We've been asked to move uh, an executive session to the first part of the meeting um, for a contractual matter. So the first thing we need to do is actually have a motion to go into executive session to discuss a contractual matter. Then we can snip out to a uh, classroom real quick and come back. So we'll do we'll a um, Drew moved. How we second it? How much of our stuff do we need to bring with us? Anything? Nothing? Okay. All right. So it's been moved and seconded to go into executive session for a contractual matter. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? All right. We're in. We'll be right back. So we're back from executive session. Um, no action comes out of it. Um, next, next piece on the agenda is actually the members of the public. So we have a lot of public with us tonight. Y'all want to introduce yourself and then let us know if you're here for some specific thing you'd like to speak about now, or you're just here to see what happens and, and perhaps add something to the discussion as we go. You want to start, Chris? Yeah, sure. Chris Barton, teacher at the high school here because I'm not on the budget. Work at the high school. Um, yeah, just listening, hearing. I care about the school, so <coughs> I want to hear what's being talked about. Okay. I'm Johanna Laskowski I also teach at Lillian and Gray, and here to support and be part of the budget conversation. Okay, and I'm Stead. I teach here right across the hallway, um, and I'm also here because of the budget. John Dimitrio, <coughs> uh, community member, and I'm here to take it all in. Okay. Yeah. Gerald Salinas, he's saying I teach Spanish here, and I'm here to support the school. Bye. Barbara Marchant, school librarian. It's not uncommon for me to be at budget meetings. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> John Evans, a citizen in towns, and just uh, out for the night. <laughs> 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 Al Glossin, Townsend Elementary School Board Chair. Uh, so this obviously have, has implications for me as well. Uh, and I certainly want some clarification on what I read in Act 46 versus an email that we have from Brad James. All right. And way in the back there. Oh, hey. I'm Amanda. I teach here. Was there something you wanted to discuss right now or you just kind of want to watch it? All right. All right. So. Um, do we have does it do we have any board correspondence? Joe? Yeah, yeah. Was that for everybody in terms of discussing? Or? Yeah, yeah. I I said you know just introduce yourself and then let me know if there's something you want to bring up right now or if there's um, you know, are you just here to kind of observe and maybe add something later? No, I, I'm definitely here to uh, have some input. Um, so we had our our school board meeting last night and. You know, we talked about the three and a half and then the 10 or the 20 in terms of uh, equalized people's uh, allowable decline according to Act 46. So I read Act 46 again last night, uh, cover to cover. And because uh, I'm bored. Yeah, no. wow. You're, you're way ahead of probably a lot of the people in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that Brad sent uh, an email stating that it looks like Leland and Gray would be in that 10% category in terms of uh, equalized pupils. But uh, I mean, unless Act 46 is incorrect, which I, I don't think it is, it clearly states, and this will take a second, but I'll, I'm going to read what it says. Hang on. If I can get there. Um, I'll tell you what section I'm looking at. <coughs> Section 23, it talks about declining enrollment and transition. First part of it is kind of the, the whole doomsday information about um, 
in year one. In fiscal year 2017, the district's equalized pupils shall in no case be less than 90% of the district's equalized pupils in the previous year. And in fiscal year 2018, the district equalized people shall in no case be less than 80% of the district's equalized pupils in the previous year. So that's kind of the scary part. But then if you read that in section uh, two, uh, C, right below that it says, notwithstanding the provisions of subsections A and B of this section, if a district is actively engaged in mer merger discussions with one or more other districts regarding the formation of a regional education district, we are, we have been, or other form of unified school uh, union school district pursuant to 16 BSA chapter 11, then section 22 of this act shall apply to the district in fiscal year 2018, which is exactly what we're discussing, and after, and each of the dates in subsection B of this section shall be adjusted accordingly. So, back to section 22. For purposes of the calculation under this section, a district's equalized pupils shall in no case be less than 96 and one half percent of the actual number of equalized pupils in the district in the previous year prior to making any adjustment under this subsection. That is absolutely and clearly uh, the law according to Act 46. And I, I, would, I would definitely recommend getting some legal advice on this as opposed to, I know Brad James is our financial guru, but I think this clearly states that, that we do, we're held at the 96 and a half. I mean, really, for what other reason would we be going through the process, the exploratory committees, the study committees? Uh, that was one of the things that we talked about from day one was here are some of the benefits of uh, going through the Act 46 process, and one of them was hold harmless, the three and a half percent. So I don't know how we got to this where it's uh, suddenly, okay, there's a transition. No, you're no longer in the three and a half percent category. You're now at 10 and then you will be at 20. So that's all I've got to say about that. Okay, so I think some of what you talked about is gonna be addressed by Lori. Yeah, it's, it's my understanding. I read that too. In fact, I have it highlighted right here. Yeah. <laughs> and question, Brad, on that. Um, and then I questioned some other business managers that have read the law and have been involved in this. And the basically, if you look down in the repeal section, phantom students go away, whether you're in a merger or not. As of fiscal year 2021, July 1st, 2020, they go away. Right. And this is part of a step down process is the, what has been explained to me over three years. It doesn't say that in the law. I can see where you say that. But like I said, I have it highlighted. But this yeah. is what I've been. Have we gotten a legal opinion? You're saying you got that from other business managers. Have, have we talked to a lawyer about that? No. no we just got this email. Right. We get this Friday night at 10 o'clock. I spent the weekend reading the Act 46. And that's as far as I've gotten so far. I don't think there's any leg to stand on. I moved on. Okay, so. Okay. Okay. So, how he moves that we get a lawyer? Get our attorney to look at this and, we, and find out if, if, this, if the law is being interpreted correctly. Need to make a motion about that? I just that something. The motion's made. Yeah, it made can it. either get seconded or not, um, and then we can vote on it. Uh, I would assume that we would have that done without needing to make a motion, but the motion is made, so. Um, is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, <laughs> discussion? Sorry, was there a second? Yes, bomb and second. Thank you. I would assume that you guys would have, um, you know, legal advice on this before we just roll over and take it, right? We can definitely get that. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's still a lot of discussion. This is extremely new information. Um, you know, Brad James is an attorney, isn't he? 
No? AOE, yeah, I thought he was AOE's attorney. But, uh, I mean, I, there will be discussion back and forth. Um, anyway, anything else? Anybody else want to say anything? Emily? Um, let's talk about timeline. Well, let's... <laughs> Before we vote, because I want to know what that means, what, what this vote actually would mean for... Um, us making decisions, and I, I know we have a timeline that we have to meet unless we, we have an annual meeting. So I guess I just would like clarification on that. So a timeline for the entire budget process? Mm -hmm. And how this vote will impact timeline. Yeah, how that quickly we could get this in front of an attorney? I mean, since we can't get it today, right? I mean, what I, does the I full timeline look like? I mean, we have a tentatively scheduled yeah. second meeting. That doesn't mean you can get an answer tomorrow, though. No. Oh, no. No, no, but I mean, I can start the process. So do we move forward without that tonight? And I guess I'm just trying to understand what the impact of this vote means. Well, the information that... Well, the motion is a little vague in terms of like do we have to get the attorney's opinion before we move forward with the budget process anymore or do we just retain one so that we can you know ultimately fight the good fight while we move forward with that's the best information we have that's what I want to clarify I'm, I didn't make who made the motion right? I made the motion and my motion is just to get an attorney's opinion that's as far as I took it so how it affects our you know we could still continue to plan based on you know what the ruling is from the DOE at the moment while we have an attorney look at it I think that you know if we turns out that they're wrong we have more money and if it turns out they're right then we, we did what we were supposed to do with the budget we were allocated all right so that that's enough clarification it's not going to affect the timeline at all Anything else? Any other discussion? Do we need a motion to actually facilitate this process? No. I don't Th think there's so. There's no board action that needs to take place for this to happen. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. Th so why are we doing this? The motion was made. We can direct without actually having to make a motion and pass it. I think we need to get clear on what we're doing here. Well, I made the motion and it was seconded, so we can vote. you can vote it down or you can vote it all. Yeah, the motion was made. There's nothing we can do. It can either be withdrawn or we can, you know, vote vote it down. Um, as a, and if there's a, if there's no more discussion, we'll go for the vote. All in favor of the motion to wh what exactly was it, Peter? It was to get advice from the attorney. Okay. All in favor of the motion to get advice from an attorney, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Nay. Okay, sounds like one nay and the rest eyes. Uh, uh, abstentions? All right, motion passes. So, let's try and get our way back to the agenda just a little bit here. Um, Al, you're, you're, everything you want to talk about comes in just a second as soon as we get to the budget. I just wanted to see if we have any board correspondence. No? Okay. I know you... Um, and then new business, I don't think we have anything new, do we? I think it has to be brought, so we're now back to the budget. Um, I guess, you know, I don't know if everybody's even seen your email, Lori. I think you should just start with, you know, whatever you want to present, and, and, you know, we can make our decisions based on that. Okay. So does everybody have does a everybody, copy? Does anybody need handouts? Copy I only yeah. attached the Brad <laughs> email. Thank you. The, I don't want to dwell on the past, but I just want to talk a little bit about the past year in 16. So that, because for the last week, in my head, it doesn't make sense that we would have to go below last year's budget, right? Based on the first numbers that we had. And so I, 
I did some some more research and you know a couple things happened at this time last year when you were presented a budget you were actually over the cap and the reason you were over the cap is because some offsetting revenues were included that were not supposed to be included it's the career center revenues so that artificially dropped your mm -hmm. cost per student and then when you look at the the tuition budget for instance for fiscal year 16 was uh, the actual was 803 and the budget was 852 so you know we're not gaining students um, even tuition students for that matter so that was overstated by a certain amount of money so I think that you were not as drastically as you are right now but you were over the cap last year as well now there were some exclusions that brought you under the cap so some of those exclusions were uh, one in particular is principal and interest on your capital loan that what we retired that loan this year so that's not going to be an exclusion that's going to help you for for 18. So I just wanted to talk about that a little bit because it, in my mind, it didn't make sense that we had to drop below last year's budget. But in reality, you were over as well. So now we can move on to 18 and talk about that. So the first, um, does everybody understand what Lori's saying? Because that's really important. Because that, that gives us some leeway. That's that clarifies okay. a lot of information and we need to have that as a baseline to start from moving forward for this year in my opinion right okay right it definitely clarified it in my mind mm -hmm. it made me feel like okay I understand where we started from yeah. where we ended mm -hmm. up where exactly. we're at yeah okay so then we presented the first budget we presented to you I think was the 8.5 or I'm sorry 6.5 million dollar budget and that was based on the 296 that we were all hoping for um, and that was going to bring you somewhere in the vicinity of a thousand dollars over the threshold so we, we talked about that and we talked about what you charge us with what we needed to do to get under the threshold that was the charge mm -hmm. so Bob went to the drawing board and did an awesome job um, and I think he's did you pass these out okay so we have some reductions here that are leading to this budget the computer sorry so then we got I said Friday night 10 o'clock got the email from Brad about the 272 count that came through and um, that obviously put put you in a much different place now I I have prepared a little document there that talks about equalized students and it's just sort of a refresher of how equalized students are figured and it's not just a Leland and Gray problem right I think that everybody understands this is really a pre-k through 12 issue of these phantom students that have been built in over time since 1999, 1999. was the um, Act 68 law right well, so it was after, yeah, yeah. after Act and so since then everybody's been held at this cap this 3.5 cap you can't reduce more than 3.5 percent but that if you look at the sheet creates the examples that I've put out there creates phantom students and so that's what is happening you know with Brad's interpretation of the law is it's stepping down the phantom students so that eventually those go away and you're actually getting funds for what the actual equalized people is are so does that help to explain it a little bit does everybody understand that that's a really important really concept. Important. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Instead of just falling off the cliff and saying they're gone next year, they're slowly. Yeah, by two more by more fiscal more. year 2021, yeah. phantom students will no longer exist. Old harmless will no longer exist. 
so they won't. That is definitely that written into the law. It's important to, I don't know if you said this or not, but the way it was calculated before was that the 3.5% was based on the 3.5% reduction years before, so it was accumulating. Right. The Phantom students were snowballing, mm -hmm. which is what the... That's an extremely important point. Which is why the adjustment in the law was made around it, because it was even more phantom. Right, <laughs> at some point you have to get back to really right. counting. Because right. it was been calculated so, on the lower. So taxpayers have been artificially paying a lower right. tax rate than the students are spending. You know, that they're paying for, mm -hmm. really. So so that's what leads to that 276 number. Okay. So I did tell you in your email, um, since that email, we've had a couple little changes, which are good changes. And one of them is uh, Mary Martin called me today and she found a, a tuition student. So that was good. We could add one more tuition student to the uh, revenues. Just wandering around the halls. And then Brad emailed the next version, which was 276, so it went up by two. And this is by no means done yet. I mean, this is only version two. It can go to version six, so, you know. But I don't think there's going to be a lot more students unless the, the law is not interpreted correctly. Okay, so, talking through the budget. Do you want to talk about the cuts or you want me to no, okay. So last week this time you guys charged can I, can me. I, I'm sorry, oh, can sorry. I interrupt? Yep. Yes. Damn. Sure. No. I just want to make sure everyone understands about this one thing that is so important that we, because we at Leona Gray, when we were talking about the budget last year, we talked about phantom students. I think we had like one phantom student or something like that, um, which was like the first time we'd had one, I think. But it was a time when our you know, our enrollment was declining, and that was to be expected. But this is not specific to Leona Gray. I know you said it, but I want to state it again because I think it's really important. Um, it's a pre-K-12 system that we're looking at, and it's phantom students across the five towns that are impacting this that is calculation correct. now. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so the only way to have known this was to have looked at it across the five towns over the last few years knowing what was coming for us to be prepared for this and we didn't do that. Mm -hmm. right. okay. And it's very important to be looking ahead yes. at this. Right. 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 I, mean, I guess that's sort of my point. The, the declining enrollment is not stopping and then the phantom students go away. So, you know, it's, it's a double whammy um, and it's really important that we get through this budget season. And then I really would love to sit down with a group of people from this, from your board and plan a four-year budget. I mean, we have to be looking out. I mean, it's- I'm on board for that. Okay, with the, uh, <laughs> with the situation that we're in now, it's, it just seems like this has been coming and it's here. But it's not, this is the beginning. It's not really the, where it's going to end up. And if we think this is hard, I have a feeling that the snowball that's headed our way, we yeah, have a lot of work ahead of us. So yeah, right. not to interrupt, but yeah. it's, it's, this is only the beginning. Right. So I think it's really, it would be prudent of us to really look at a four year plan. <coughs> after this. I have a question. Sure. When, when this uh, law progresses to its final uh, state where there are no more phantom students, does that mean that our budget will be fluctuating precisely with the student count? And there's a, you know, we lose 10 students, man, and that's going to be, you know. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to deal with that on a yearly basis? Well, there, there is a two-year average. So ADM is, um, is a two-year two average. That's where you're, you start. You start with that two-year average, and then it's weighted according to the paper I gave you. And that's where you end up with your equalized pupils. But you are correct. But there will be no other protections around sh shifts. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's no protections on shifts high, which is good. 
Uh, but there will be no downside protections, except for the two-year average. <coughs> So, you really so multi-year you really budgeting is going to be incredibly important mm -hmm. to look at what our demographics are, to look at ourselves in the pre-K through 12 system. Yeah, attracting students. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. right. Sorry, Bob. No worries. All right. So you tasked me with finding 300 um, last week, which was the amount that would have taken us to the phantom threshold. Um, and so you, this page looks like this. It has a box with some things on it. Uh, <coughs> walk you through this list to get you to your total of 300. Um, one of the first, the first uh, an obvious one was the removal of the assistant principal position, which was an ad uh, in the budget uh, for the school this year. Um, with that coming out, though, one of the things, and I've described this in the text below, um, uh, what I would do is I would close the planning room and re-staff uh, that person um, as a dean of students. So I asked for a little bit more money to put back in to help make that a reality. Um, the next one, in, in talking about sabbaticals that have been requested, they're still sort of on the table, I guess you could say, for this group to consider. Um, you know, Bill and I talked a lot about that and um, recommending that that be something we consider as leaves of absence rather than as sabbaticals so that the, the health care costs are not something that we would have to incur. Uh, the next four or five lines getting from four through eight are all just some uh, discretionary funds from the budget that I think we can reduce. Um, line nine, uh, I asked Marty to take a look at the co-curricular budget to see if there was anything in there that he felt he could reduce. Um, and we talked a little bit about the snowboarding program, which is a VPA sanctioned event, but it's on probation with the VPA, which means that there's not a lot of schools doing it still. And if they have student schools dropping out, or if they don't gain more schools, they could actually remove the VPA sanction from that. So I made a couple of calls and found out there's at least one of the high school in the area removing it in their budget process as well. So it seems logical that this will probably not be a VPA sanctioned event moving forward. So reducing that, which includes stipends for a coach, a coach and some transportation costs, seemed like um, a logical approach from the co-curricular. And then getting to the two big ones, um, we have uh, in our music department a 1.83 1 FTEs of music instruction. So it's my recommendation that we riff the 0.83 and get down to one whole. And we currently have five science teachers in the budget, so it's my recommendation to riff one and get to four, thus bring us to a total of 300. With the music program, you guys want to know about impact. Up, I mean, the snowboarding team, obviously, there's an impact on kids who snowboard. It's not a huge number, but it's definitely, there's an impact there. Um, the music reduction I wrote, that's difficult to predict what the actual impact will be. Um, one, one strong suspicion I have is that we will not be able to offer the private pull-out lessons um, on instruments that we've been offering and has been the tradition here for a long, long time. And that we may lose an elective, um, perhaps two, uh, general music for the middle school or technology music for the high school or maybe both it would be the casualty as one person have to take on both middle and high school chorus and band. Um, so that was the impact there. Um, as there's only one section of band and chorus for each high school in this language, it's not really an impact with class size. In fact, we would like them to be bigger, so that's not really a concern. The science reduction, um, again, we haven't started building a schedule. It's very early in the process. Uh, the reason that I identified science was that with, uh, we were already in the budget, I talked about not replacing uh, an English teacher who was leaving, English teacher slash literacy coach. And we had talked about taking out the .67 math that had been added in for this fiscal year um, after adoption of the budget. So <clears throat> this reduction in science would bring science, English, math, and social studies all at the same staffing level of four total, seven to 12. So it kind of equalizes those four core subjects. Um, I don't know what the impact will be. Um, there might not be any on, on uh, kids. There might be maybe one less selective, bigger class sizes, but it's hard to really predict at this point. So. Um, and then at the bottom, what I tried to do, I know I was thinking of how when I did this, um, was I tried to list, so last year, this year, and this proposed budget year, 
to try to show the number of actual teachers we have, the equivalent FTEs of those people, the equalized pupil count that we've used, and then trying to develop an index. And I want to be cautioning you, this is not a class size number, this is not a teacher to student ratio. This is just a, an index to use to measure, all right? So don't think that this means anything as far as a classroom setting. All we're trying to do is show you an equalized pupil count per FTE. So it's really a meaningless number, but it gives you an index. And you can see um, with the staffing, with the equalized pupil count went down for this fiscal year, FY17, um, you, you actually increased the FTE of the staff. Um, so that brought down that ratio to, from 9.9 to 9.2. The, the number 276 that Lori's given us, um, plus the reductions that I've put forth in the first draft, plus these additional ones, uh, would bring us back up to 9.7. So, so it speaks to the, how I was talking about was having staff reduce when students reduce. So it's, a, it's an attempt to demonstrate that correlation. Questions? Thank you. What's the actual people count? <clears throat> the actual people yeah. count. Right now is 311. Okay. That's, That's what, what we submitted. reported this year. Yeah. I would like to know um, what exactly is general music and the technology of music and how many students are in those classes? So general music is part of the middle school rotation for exploratories. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that every seventh and eighth grader um, has a rotation for a quarter long where they go to a general music class, much like an elementary general music class. Okay. There's some instruments, there's some singing, there's theory, music theory, that kind of stuff. So that basically gets an instrument into a student's hands that maybe has always wanted to try one and never who had hasn't, the opportunity. Who hasn't picked it up in the past, correct. Okay. Um, so it would, and again, I'm, and I'm not saying it would definitely end that program, mm -hmm. but it's certainly a potential that it would, just mm -hmm. because the staff room would be spread out with too many different things to offer. Um, the technology of music is a high school class that was developed, and it's, I think it's evolved over the years, but the idea is for kids, it's non-musicians, really, um, accessing um, music theory slash using technology, sound boards, development of electronic composing, those kinds of things, um, to get kids who are typically non-musicians <coughs> into the musical world. And how many students are we talking who would be taking that? Um, well, the, the General music would be every middle school student gets it for a quarter. So that's the entire middle school right now. Mm -hmm. The tech of music, um, I'm going to guess and say 15 to 20 a year. Okay. I think we run two sections of it one in the fall, one in the spring. I could be wrong. Are there music teachers in the audience? No, no. Not Does that sound yeah. right? Yeah. And, there's, and they're typically <coughs> eight to 10 kids. But we would still sessions. be offering <coughs> basic band, chorus. Band, chorus, high school, middle school. So Jazz all, band, acapella. Well, those things, are, those things are extras. Those are part of the co-curricular contract. They're stipended positions in addition to. Those are not part of the school day. Mm -hmm. Those things are not part of this reduction. Okay. Anybody else? No other questions from the board? Anybody in the audience? Al? <laughs> yeah, just to kind of get grounded in, uh, if we could do some baseline numbers on the top line numbers. So if you look in the back page, uh, comparison year over year, FY17 versus FY18, what was the education spend? Uh, so whatever the budget was minus offsetting revenues for both this year and for last year, FY17 and 18. But defer to my colleague. <laughs> <laughs> so in fiscal yeah. year 17, um, your okay. expenses were 7.1 million. You see that there, right? No, I'm, I'm talking about, so in order to get the education spend, mm -hmm. so what, what would that be, minus the offsetting revenues? Well, it was reported as 4,8858. Um, it should have been actually, uh, I'll give you that number. It should have been four million nine. Okay. Okay. And this year? 5106 based on this budget, presented budget. Okay. And this year the, um, 
equalized pupil per pupil spending is max is seventeen three sixty five. Is that right? Uh, seventeen three eighty six. Seventeen three eighty six. In the equalized pupils that we showed last year was three eleven. No, right? two ninety six point five three. Two ninety six point five three. And this year's calculation is two seventy six point three nine. And that's at that ten percent reduction. Yes. So the budget that we presented on the sixth was six million five, as I said, and then this one is six million two. So the actual reduction is three hundred and twenty-three thousand dollars. The extra twenty-three was in career center, a reduction in career center FTEs based on a six semester average. Those numbers have not come out yet, so that may change. But I looked back three years and took an average of those three years just to, to have a number to plug in there. And it was less than what was budgeted last year. So that brings your um, first pupil spending <coughs> to 18476 which is still over the cap $5,000. Sure. Um, I appreciate Bob's challenge over this past week to come down to make these reductions, and there's, there's quite significant impact. Um, one piece that's missing from there, and it sort of seems like it's disappeared, um, and not necessarily a cut, is the French program, because with the Sarah <coughs> Boucher leaving, who is one half of the French teaching team, and the possibility of Ruth Ann Dunn um, being accepted for her sabbatical, which she is the other half, if both of those two teachers are gone, what happens to the French program? And so there's nothing cut, but there's nothing in place for it to carry on. So I guess I'm curious, what's the status of Leland and Gray continuing to have a French program or losing a French program, and how do yeah. folks feel about and that? And so I, what I did is uh, I didn't include that because it was sort of, um, it's contingent on what happens with the sabbatical request and whether or not she receives it. If, <coughs> if the, with this cut for science in, if she is gone, then the impact would be there would be no French program offered through direct instruction. Let me come back to that in a second. If she was here, then I think we'd have to make some decisions uh, moving forward around what the enrollment numbers look like and what we were doing in the middle school and what, how that's going to impact where we go with French moving forward. But if she's not here, then we won't have a licensed teacher. So there's nothing in the budget for that um, as a single world language department. It would really just come out of science, which may or may not be possible depending on who's here and what other sections we would have. But let me come back to where I was going initially, which was I did reach out to um, Jeff Renard, who is the director of the Vermont Virtual Learning Collaborative, which is the online program that mm -hmm. you guys authorized me adding uh, at the beginning of the school year, and they do offer French through that program. So our students would have access to a Vermont licensed French instructor. Clearly, doing that online is different than doing it in a classroom setting. I think Carol will agree. Um, but it is an option that will provide access to French instruction uh, through online. So regardless of where we go, we could students will be able to access that. What is the French enrollment in middle school like currently? Well, in middle school, it's pretty decent. I would say there's probably 18 to 20 in each grade. Mm -hmm. um, in the high school, it's significantly lower. So that's why I said it depends on what we do with the middle school model and how we, if, whether or not we continue to do languages in the middle school or not for high school credit. We have that's something that we've got to, we've had meetings scheduled to discuss it and they keep getting bumped for emergency staff meetings to talk about the budget. So. Um, but that's something that we do have to address and figure out what we're going to do with that. And certainly for the seventh graders, they're in French 1. That's a real they're loss they're for them a. to not be able to complete French 2. They're in 1A, which means they would still need the other part of French 1. That's to get any kind of to get credit. Anything. Yep. So we have to look at that and how we would deal with that if that was the case. Yep. And, and I would imagine, but I'm not a teacher, so I don't know, that um, possibly it would be easier for a higher level French student to do an online course as opposed to the beginners 
doing an online course. Yep, I think it's a definitely a better option for the kids who are in three and four now to finish okay. four and five than it would be, I think, what Kelly points out for the one B or whatever those square level those kids might be at. Because of the age, because of the level of language learning, and just their skill around being able to do an online course as well. So a lot of factors. Including the French for those middle school kids would be a shame. But it's the exact same conversation we had last year. The yep. exact same conversation mm -hmm. for the seventh graders going to eighth grade. Yeah. It's just to remember where we were at a year ago. Yeah. Right. Two years, was that two years ago? Yeah. It might have been two years ago. Yeah. 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 We have. And just an additional piece of when they do get into the high school, um, as Bob mentioned, that there's significant numbers in the middle school. Um, in part, those numbers lower in the high school. Um, it's not a lack of interest, it's scheduling. There's always, as in we've gotten, you've heard this before, so um, I just want you to understand that it's for all of us in the world languages. Um, once we get into competition with AP English or AP um, Chemistry or any of the other, or just the scheduling, kids can't fit it into their schedules. <coughs> and so years go by, and but that the numbers don't always indicate a lack of interest. No, I'll add to that. I think That's the scheduling true. has been a challenge um, here historically, but I would temper that a little bit by saying that the in the middle school the kids were required to enroll in a language they could pick which one. The high school level there is no world language requirement, so students aren't required to take one. So that would account for some drop in enrollment as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Would the online course alleviate the scheduling problem? I mean, if it's online, does it take place at a certain time? Or it's asynchronous. What's that? It's asynchronous, meaning the kids can take it whenever they can do it from so home. So it may work out better to have an online course. Yeah. 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 Emily, I got Dan. Actually, yeah. I'll skip. All right, Dan. Because he answered. Um, I'm sorry, I'm late. I was at a concert at Wyndham. Um, and just a quick answer to your question about if, if there's no general music instruction and kids don't get those instruments in their hands, what that will mean is the band will go away because people don't miraculously start playing instruments later in life, they need that introduction to get that on. Um, you know, Vermont is clearly facing a demographic challenge, and we are here as well. You know, our numbers are dwindling. But it seems, like when I come to these board meetings, it seems like it's a money board, and I'm waiting for the school part. I don't hear our kids in this conversation other than a number. You know, how much the state is going to allow us to spend on this kid and how much it's going to cost this and what the cap is. So Vermont has faced this in the past. When, when the bottom fell out of the merino wool market and people discovered that they could plow ground without having to mine stones first, everybody left. And Vermont was empty. And 85% of the state which was open turned into trees. And we were going back into primeval forest. But somehow people drifted back. And we became a populous state again and we have a population. So. It is true right now there's a, there's a drop in our population. To think that that is a permanent condition is not based in any kind of reality. There's, there's no reason, no, no kind of logic that can say no one will ever come back to Vermont. So we're looking at a, a situation we don't know how temporary it is. But it's a temporary situation. So I think the, the question we should be asking ourselves is, do we place any value on our children right now our schools are not only instructing kids. We're not only teaching kids to do the things they need to do to get a graduate, to graduate. We are also dealing with major social ills and issues. We have kids, you know one of, one of the, the most successful learning programs we've had at Leon Gray? Getting kids to a dentist, which we had to pony up money to figure out how to pay for kids to go to a dentist so they wouldn't be unable to learn because their bowels were hurting. We put food in their stomachs because not all kids can come to the school and have enough food to eat. But yet when we talk to Montpelier, we talk to, we talk to legislators, when we talk about that, they go, yeah, well, I, yeah, well, I know that's a situation. You're just gonna have to think outside the box because in the past it didn't cost that much to, you know, to our kids. We are in a situation right now where if we wanna give up on our kids, then by all means, let's cut $300,000 out of this budget and let, because what's going to happen? I will guarantee you, if you do this and you just like go by the cap, you cut your $300,000, you cut music, so the music program tanks, you cut French, what you will do is you will guarantee that this school will be closed. I don't know if it'll be in five years or seven years or two years, 
you will guarantee that people will not move into this town because the school does not have what they need for their kids. When that happens, your property tax values go down, your property tax rate goes down, everything yeah. tanks. So if you want to have any future of these sending towns, then you need to be willing to stand up for our school. If you want to have any interest in our kids in this valley, doing something more than just suffering under economic and social ills, then you need to be willing to invest in this school. And when we have had the votes that were, when we had budget votes, and even when we lost the budget vote, and we went to the people and we talked about what the need was and we explained the need, people have consistently voted for this school and our elementary schools. They have voted for these budgets, even though in towns and stuff we've had, we've had our troubles, historically, for a long time. For us to give, what you, what you, essentially, if, if you go with this cut, you're giving up. And I don't understand why we would want to give up on our kids when a time right now, which is such, so fraught with danger, so fraught with you know, the opioid crisis, poverty, abuse, trauma, we, we are in a, in a state of crisis. We need to be wrapping ourselves around our kids and around our communities. Our communities and our schools are our strength. And if you want, because of, of, of an idea about a, of a tax, somebody having to pay higher taxes in a state that has property tax rebates for people up to, I don't know what the number is, if it's seventy, ninety thousand dollars $90,000. If you are truly a poor person in the state of Vermont, when the property taxes go up, you get some relief, <coughs> substantial relief from the state of Vermont. And that the more you make, the less, the less relief you get. So we are not, when, when, when we were talking about budgets, we are talking about bean counters and their numbers and their words. And we have a, we have a new governor. And, and one of the reasons, he's, he's a guy who's not interested in, in spending a lot of extra money. That's true. One of the main reasons he got in, in, elected, though, was because he was also not a big fan of Act 46 and, and the obligatory concept of Act 46. He's interested in easing up some of these deadlines. He's trying to figure out, as are many senators at, in the state level, they're trying to figure out how to deal with this to make it a little more equitable so we don't have to lose our schools. Because mark my words, you are going down the path of losing our school. You know, the school I came from tonight, Wyndham, by all accounts, should not exist. Little schools, like 12 kids, two <coughs> teachers, how can these kids ever learn? <coughs> like I this way. They have some of the best performing kids. I, pl I play concerts in, you know, three or four elementary schools I've done it for years and years. Wyndham consistently has one of the best group of kids ready to learn. They do well. And when they come here in this school, just go down to the list of salutatorians, valedictorians. See how many kids from Wyndham are on that list. A tiny little school, that school from the past, which has no place in modern America, is, is a stellar school because the people of that town care about it. The people in these towns care about this school. But I don't see the board caring about it. You know, I see the board talking about money, and I, and I, and I, and I you know, up in Montpelier, that it's all about, we just have to face the facts, you know, it's, it's a, we just have to, we, we have no choice. Well, we do have a choice. We have a choice in this country to decide to invest in our children, or we have a choice to invest in ourselves and the things we want to buy. That seems to me like it'd be a very easy choice. I would urge the board to advocate for this school, advocate for these kids, figure out, you know, okay, we, we, there's more money than we can spend. Maybe we should figure out a way to raise some money. Maybe we have to, as pathetic and ridiculous as it is, maybe we have to have something so the school can raise $10,000, you know, some kind of campaign where we're reaching out to wealthy individuals or we washing cars, I don't know what it is. But to automatically think that we can just cut our way out of this mess and we're not destroying the school is not true. You're kidding yourself. Patty, well, I believe said. you were next. Um, no. True. I, I, as a member of this board and the Act 46 study committee, I can assure you and the public that we have had many, many conversations about students. Um, I believe it's probably the first thing I say every time I speak. So um, I, I would challenge that you know, this board doesn't care about the students of, of this school and the district because we spend a lot of time looking at what is best for our students. Unfortunately, uh, there is a financial reality to operating a school district. Uh, we have to be able to uh, provide for 
the education of the kids, but we also have to be able to provide uh, for the taxpayers a reasonable bill associated with that. We have to be responsible on both sides. So as a board, we do have difficult decisions to make, uh, and we are considering the students, and we're taking the advice of our administration uh, in where, what areas we can, in fact, cut and what areas we shouldn't be cutting. And that's the work that the board is doing right now. Thanks. And before we go too far down the path talking about, you know, the cuts that Bob has suggested, proposed, and, and some of what, what we've done, realize here that we're still almost $1,100 above the spending threshold with these cuts. We need to discuss what tolerance we have for going forward with this budget, or do we need more cuts? And how deeply can we cut? Or do we want to cut? And what are we willing to take to our towns? Um, you know, to get under the spending threshold, what, it's, it's now somewhere around 600,000, like 10% of our entire budget, to get under the spending threshold? Lori, you have? Well, without these cuts, it's another 300 with the cuts that we've already made. So 676 was the assuming problem. we assuming we keep everything cuts. that Bob's already Correct. said we need yeah. we we can do. It's another three yeah. something, 301, right? 301 it's to get down under the spending threshold again. And at our last meeting, our direction on looking at this budget was that we did not feel comfortable going back to our towns with the over the spending threshold for the double taxation. And we said go get under. Bob's done it. None of this is is pleasant, but it's well thought out. You can see that it impacts the fewest number of kids, and there's every every one of these things. There's a contingency for how we're going to do it and how we're going to keep trying to offer as much as we possibly can to our children facing the economic realities. But we have another we have another big problem. Do what what are we going to do with the new information, the the new equalized spending? You know, do we say go back and try again? Do we tell them to get under the threshold? Do we s now now that if we've decided that we cannot possibly operate under the threshold, then you know make the best make the best stab you can? I mean, we need to we need to give them some direction so that they can come back if we're going to send them back again. Just wanted to put that out there because I think yeah. that's going to take a little time to I discuss. Go ahead. I think we need to explain to the general public what is going to happen when we go over that. How is that going to affect your tax bill? I mean, does it automatically go into the school part of your tax bill? Do we feel it you here the with the percentage portion? of the increase or decrease? Can you? So, so the first thing that happens when you're over the cap is there are some exclusions that can come off of that. And, and I don't know any of those right now, mm -hmm. because those are going to come from the state. They give you that number, and I double check them. So last year, like I said, there was enough exclusions to get you under the cap. So that, ha that has to happen first. And then the um, next number is the yield um, that is put forth by the tax commissioner, which was 10076 so all things being equal, we'll say you didn't have any uh, reduction in expenses or revenue or increases in expenses, and you were at the cap. So this, the cap is 17,386 divided by the yield. Basically, you're talking a dollar 73, mm -hmm. right? On a 100% CLA. See, all these numbers yeah. have to come in before we can get to a real number. Last year, the tax rate on the the three-year comparison was a dollar sixty-five was estimated, and I think you guys came in at like a dollar seventy-two. So, you know, you can see from the time that this meeting happens to the time when you actually get taxed, it can change. But it's significant with the penalty. So the penalty is added to your per pupil cost, which is the double taxation. So that's where you get the increase in your tax rate. So, you know, looking at this right here, if you're $1,000 over the cap, you add that to the 18,000, you're at 19.5 now, divided by the 10.076 is $1.94, and you were at $1.72. 
And we didn't get penalized last year. No, even because, of we the, were over, because, because of the, the threshold. Ex right, because of the exclusions. exclusions. And, and the exclu some exclusions will drop this. When do we know about exclusions? I'm hoping in by the 15th or by the next meeting, I'm hoping there'll be something. I, okay. I know that Brad was, I've emailed him. I know that Emily has spoke to him about the timeline for, for Leland Gray. That we're like the earliest in the state to vote. One. One of them. So. New Fane's right with us. We can, I, yeah, New Fane and Leland Gray. We need to get this fixed. New Fane's too. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's really hard to work on all these but assumptions. We know, we know there's one exclusion that we don't have this year that we had last year, though. Correct. Which, Which is the interest. Interest in principal and interest. So already, yeah. we're behind the able. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had something to add? Yeah, so yes. is there a way that at some point you can give us, like, because Frank used to do a thing where he'd give us kind of an estimate of uh, how many dollars per household might result from different fluctuations in the budget. Okay. And I don't know how he did Yeah, it. you had asked me in yeah. an email about that. And because a dollar amount means more to people, I think, than mm -hmm. 1.94 or something, you know, because So it's are you, you're saying like on a $100,000 house? Correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, I will give yeah, you those. He used to I mean, I'd like to get a little more information from the state yeah. before no, I start I throwing out yeah. those yeah, numbers. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, um, because yeah. you... You know, people get those numbers in their head, and then they see the reality, which happens months and months later. Yep. So, no, I, I have another, I have a little list of questions. It's a little list, three questions. Um, how is, we're, we've had a defi deficit, we've been running a deficit, and we had a transportation issue last year. Where is all that in here? Have we taken care of the deficit? Yeah, so you do not have a deficit going into 18. Okay. Um, the audit report is not finalized, but I'm in constant contact with them. And um, barring any major uh, issues at the very end, looking like you're going to have like a $5,000 surplus. Not a lot. But, but that can be applied to this mm -hmm. as well. That's very good news. That is good news. Yeah. I will caution, however, that 17 is going to be dicey. Yeah. No. So but going why into start 19, out with a, you yeah. may be right. You yeah. may have a deficit going into 19. Because right. we've because been working on that for years <coughs> and we haven't been able to. Um, mm -hmm. Right. And then did I have another one? Oh, I just had how this is all affecting mm -hmm. because I assume there's effects on the elementary schools and their budgets and we don't know. I read Jamaica's minutes but I don't, I couldn't really get an idea of how much their budget has changed or whatever, but I, that's always something we've tried to consider as well because we'll vote on that at town meeting and that's all on top of what we do mm -hmm. and they do and, and I'm sure they're suffering from this phantom okay. student thing. They're suffering the most, actually. Yeah, I bet. Mm -hmm. Emily, you had a question? Uh, I just wanted to um, shift for a second to what we look like next year because as we're trying to make decisions now, it's so easy to stay caught in the moment. But if we know um, what we're facing next year and the year after, and the year after, I mean, we've all seen our, our graph that shows that thing, that shows our numbers. If we're looking at a further reduction next year, <laughs> that should impact the conversation we're having right now because we're just going to, we, if we don't address it now, it's going to compound down the road. Am I right? Yes, you are right. And this says to me there's no relief until 2020. Which is why you're talking about a four-year plan. We know these numbers are, and they're reasonable estimates. estimates, and we need to, you know, we need to get something now and then literally look at a three and four year plan right. Where does so that go? we can distribute this as we as we change the face of what we have to do given the financial realities it makes sense right yeah i mean this this data was taken off of this year's census that was sent into the state and how many seventh graders were coming in from the sending towns and how many seventh graders possibly could be coming in from tuition towns. and you flatlined the tuition number yeah is that because there's really no way to do that okay right yeah but we've been
fairly accurate with this chart in the last number we of have, years. Since I mean, we, we have no reason to believe that this is going to fluctuate greatly. It, it will fluctuate some clearly, but it, there's no reason to believe that it's going to be a huge change. So the one of the conversations that I had with Brad, um, he said, you know, they expected, and you you sh you know would know this as well for all of your uh, legislation is that they expected the, the enrollments to flatline or much earlier, and they didn't. They continued to drop. So I will just, if I can, yeah. just, just say one thing. I'm looking at the Joint Fiscal Office um, has, a, has a graph on here, and it's showing the exact same kind of decline coming through the state of Vermont that mimics this quite clearly. In fact, um, it's still going down till 2021. And um, the steepest decline is behind us, but there's still a pretty significant decline, and it really starts to flatten out, and maybe even it really is quite similar to this, and it goes out to 2025. That's um, showing. So we really don't. Everybody's predicting the same right. sort of thing. It's all pointing in the same. <coughs> right. One sec, Dan. Um, just a quick question. You're not willing, I, I can understand why you don't want to go to taxpayers and say, you know, we need to raise taxes, this is actually going to, you're actually going to pay more on your tax bill. But it's not fair if you don't say to them, but if we do what we're going to do, your high school is doomed. I mean, that's that's yeah. part of the equation, and that's the part you're not talking about. It's, we're it's talking about how it's not going to be well, doomed. But the thing, the thing is, is if you cut these programs and you make the school to, yeah. the, cut to the extent that these don't offer, <clears throat> this, we don't offer that, forget about music, forget about this, forget about that, you will not get the kids to come to this place. So it's, it's, a, it's a death by a thousand cuts. You could offer people a choice. You say, look, here's what we'd like to do to keep our school. This will cost you, if you have a hundred, for every hundred thousand dollars in your home, this will cost you a hundred bucks. Are you willing to do this? But this is what we'll have. And this is what we'll have if you, we don't do that. This is what you'll get in the school if we don't do that. And this is what the future of that school looks like. And you'd be true to what that future really looks like we can't just pretend that we can keep taking things away and somehow we'll stumble through and educate our children sufficiently and get people to come to our school. We can't continue to pretend that. We have to be straight up. Yeah, and I'm, go ahead. Dan, I, I hear what you're saying and uh, we all understand that here. Our job here is the money, pretty much. That's This, this is a budget meeting. I am the Wyndham rep to this board. So I know the Wyndham Elementary School really well, and I'm glad that you pointed out that with just two teachers teaching multi-age classrooms, Wyndham gets tremendous results from our kids. Where I disagree with you is that when you say that a $300,000 cut is going to lead to the end of this school, I cannot agree with that. Just like you pointed out, once upon a time there were a lot of people in Vermont, and then they all left, and there were big cuts. They didn't keep all those little one-room schoolhouses. They didn't keep all the teachers. We have to, to make this school viable, we have to keep the staffing lined up with the enrollment. There's no, we have no other choice. It doesn't mean the end of the school. You do have a choice. Well, we, we pay higher taxes. You, you don't want to take that choice, I can understand, but it is a choice. Well, we money. have to get this budget passed, and people are only going to, you know, if our, if our cost per pupil is, you know, $4,000 higher than the neighboring schools, then the taxpayers are going to say, well, why not just close the school and send the kids to the other schools? They are? You know, they and don't want to send their kids to Brattleboro from Warsaw? Well, we have to keep, the, we have to keep our, our costs in line with the student population. You know, we don't like doing this. No, we, it's, it's, it's terrible to have to cut stuff. But we are losing students. We can't keep losing students and keep all the teachers. We just can't. And it's not a... And I, where I disagree with you is that th this is a crisis. A crisis would be if we had a growing enrollment and had to cut teachers. That would be pretty awful. Fact is, we have less kids. We have to have less teachers, and it's a hard it's a hard pill to swallow. But that's what it boils down to. If we want to keep offering the same level of services to our kids, just like the Wyndham Elementary School, the teachers at Wheeling and Gray. And the kids are going to have to figure out different ways of learning. We have the internet. We have online classes. It may turn out there there will be more kids taking French in high school because they could fit it into their schedule with an online class. I don't. I agree with you that cutting the budget means the end of our school. 
in any way. I think we can keep the important stuff here. We can keep offering our classes. We can keep this place going in line with the enrollment the number of kids we have here. I'd like to say something. Go ahead. Um, we do care about this school. I was a student here. I was in the band when the band had 75 to 80 percent of the student body involved in it. And I've seen how declining enrollment and scheduling has diminished what used to be a very vital part of this school. And I'm going to urge you to try to keep the general music because it gets those instruments into kids' hands <clears throat> that have maybe never had that outlet. Music is so important. If you take that away, it, it's, it's going to be, you're going to see those results in a lot of different ways in the school. I know we have things that we need to look at closely. Maybe if someone could do the technology of music as a winter activity, that might be an option. It's not going to be a full-time thing, but at least we'd still be providing it. I'm more than willing to work with the band mm -hmm. department. I'm a drummer. I know. We have that. I, I mean, I, I'm willing to donate my time if that will help. I just think that it's very important to look at what we're going to be cutting or thinking about cutting. And music is very important, and I hate to see that on there. I realize we've got to look at everything, but I think we need to see the implications of something like that. We still have to go back, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. and really discuss what the next step is. Um, you know, we're still talking about these cuts when there are three hundred thousand dollars more cuts that could be there you know we're being accused of not being willing to go to the taxpayers and ask for a tax increase I'm not sure that I'm unwilling to do that I, I'm not sure that it's not worth maybe going over the spending threshold but I also don't want to sit there at you know three maybe three hundred thousand it's like maybe there's a little more that we can find there's there's gonna have to be some you know and as part of a four-year plan, we may have to lose even more or rearrange even more. But you know, we need to we need to really come up with the direction that we, as a board, want to give the administration for what they're going to do, uh, unless we're willing to you know pass this budget and take this to our voters, um, which is possible. You um, mean take so approve these three hundred thousand cut in cuts, still take a budget to our voters, which is three hundred thousand over the threshold. Is that is that what you're a thousand per student over a thousand the thousand per student. I'm saying that if that's what we're willing to do, then we don't have to talk about what we do as future direction. I, I my suspicion is is that we want to come somehow closer to the threshold um, rather than stay eleven $1 hundred dollars per student over it. Um, but you know, again I'm I'm only one person. I have hands everywhere here. Hang on now. Patty, I think you were first, then um, Emily, then Al. Yeah, I, um, I would have nothing against seeing the possibilities. However, I had a serious problem when I looked online and did not see any of the budgets online. So there's no way that anybody out in the public has any information about this. And, and that I would not want to come to a next meeting without all the all the different scenarios online at the website dates of meetings it really out there because I mean nobody has any way to get a budget other than calling someone and I was shocked because I was going to put a link on the Jamaica um, and I know you're it's a new administration so I'm not pointing any fingers truly I'm not I felt bad because it's like oh my god I'm the internet guru I should have looked and seen it not there because that's how I got on the board was these drafts are coming me. these drafts are coming very very late I don't think anybody would have had this online I mean, we got handed. Oh, no, this wasn't emailed to us nothing's online there wasn't even anything. But, but there on wasn't the a budget page. to put on. There wasn't really anything. There were drafts. There were there were earlier there versions. Were there were earlier versions yes. that could have been on, but this one was completed today. No, I know, but I would right. like I would like people to be able to see all the different 
conversions well, and the rationale. Has that happened in the past? Because yes, we've okay. in the past rationale. our draft budget has been up. Yeah. You know, the board would get it and we would post it on the website so that the the general public could get it. And as and it changed, <coughs> it was and, and rationales were put up and everything. Huh. Yep, yeah. like all of that these things year. would be. Yeah. Well, it's typically happened for me. I think it happened. I'm pretty sure it happened last year. And I, I didn't. It's okay. Yeah, it we just, you know, it's yeah. it's easily corrected. Mm -hmm. You had something. I was just going to say that given yeah, Al has something. This, I just it would be irresponsible not to ask what that extra three hundred dollar three hundred thousand dollar cut looks like for us. I think we need to know because if we don't know, we're ignoring what the future is is going to um, throw in our laps next year as well. So I, I would like to know what it's going to look like. I don't know what, what this board's going to decide, but I think we need to know. Okay, Al. So just for clarification, are we saying that we need an additional three hundred thousand? Mm -hmm. Yes. On top of this. On top of that to get here. under the threshold. So if you're at uh, fifty one oh six, and we need to drop if, if we're going with the two seventy six on the for the students and black people. You need to drop uh, 1087 to get to the threshold, which by my calculations is 301,000, which I think you've already pretty much done, right? No, that's, that's an addition, addition on top of Because the previous budget was 6.5 million. There you go. So, yeah. so you're looking at the current budget. Right. Right. So there was a which previous. Has the 300 which has 300,000 dollars in it. Out of it. And is still eleven hundred. And this over afternoon, per we found out we're eleven hundred per student over. Right. Got it. Okay, so this is because of the drop in the equalized people. We were basing everything off of last year's equalized people count of two ninety six. Okay. The first time around. Can, can I ask sure. a quick question? Uh, sure. Al originally put forth this idea about challenging mm -hmm. how this is laid out. Just for argument's sake, if what would it look like if he was right? 131,000. More? More. Instead of. On instead top of, of this or on top of the. No, he needs an addition. Uh, additions of, additions of 300 are already taken. So, so 130 instead of 300 one is what you're seven. saying will be the difference. Yeah. 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 Based on an equalized people number of. 286.15. Right. Yeah, it's coming in at 283, so we're close. <laughs> yeah. So last year was 296.53? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, my reason for suggesting that is, pursuant to Tommy's motion earlier, best case scenario under the cap would be 130 additional, is what you'd be looking at. Worst case scenario would be 301. And we won't know what those cases are until we actually have the equalized pupil number sorted out. So we need to decide if we're going to ask administration to come back with 130 less or 301 less, or none of those. Or all. Or all. Mm, that's a lot of work for the 300. And I'll say, I mean, I'll say this. I told this to the staff today, and we talked. The we've already heard from people who are concerned about the impact that the th your first 300 has on mm -hmm. kids. And I think people have spoken very eloquently about that. Um, and I don't disagree with the principle of where they're coming <coughs> from on these things. Obviously, the, as <coughs> someone mentioned, the attempt was to do it with the minimal impact of kids. It was pretty, uh, pretty upfront with you guys initially. There, there was going to be an impact to kids. Mm -hmm. There's no way to avoid that. Mm -hmm. If there was, then, then you would have bigger problems, probably. Mm -hmm. um, anything from this point on, I'm going to tell you, is 100% going to have an impact on a much wider breadth of kids. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just be aware of that going in, and that might be okay. For some of you might say that that's what fiscally has to be done, and others say we can't afford to do anything else. I just want you to know that there's, when you're, a number like 300, you're talking quite a few staff members, and which means significantly higher class sizes and <coughs> significantly fewer offerings, or entire departments potentially disappear. So I wanna make sure that that's, I'm happy, well, I'm not happy. I will do what I'm told to do, but I wanna make sure you guys are aware going in, that's what you're asking for, Understood. which might be important to have so that you can be educated yeah. on what that means. That might that's be right. the point, but you. But I think you'll, you'll need to see it. I will also say that to do that 
without having developed a new schedule here, which is, these guys will tell you, desperately needs to be done, um, with some reconfiguration of the middle school, it's, there's going to be a lot of variables in play. It's going to be a lot of guessing, educated guessing around what the impact will actually be. So the, the further down that road we go, the less accurate I'm, I feel confident in my ability to tell you what the impact is, just so you know. Mm -hmm. The okay. deeper you go, the, the tougher that's going to be to be able to ascertain. Okay. Can, can I go just ahead. follow up? Do you anticipate that same um, challenge coming next year as well? Given well, the that's numbers what I was going to. I was going to ask Lori about where these what these numbers tell us about next year, with a 300 additional and without a 300 additional now, and what that potentially could lead to. If that's not fair to ask her on the spot, <laughs> but if if we're looking at this 300 it comes off. <coughs> And we're going to need another 300 next year. That's very different than saying this 300 can stay on, and we need 400 next year. You know what I'm saying? Like what? How I deep is this going to be in the next? And I would rather have you have the good data from Lori when Lori actually has good data for you to present us real, well, better information. And that presents another problem because the timeline, I mean, so as tight. it currently stands, to vote when we currently plan to vote in early February, makes this really hard to pull off. Can we push that back? Well, that was a question I was going to ask, and I don't. I, I was here when we moved from doing the vote in the annual meeting to an Australian ballot. I remember that. I don't know why it doesn't happen. The Australian ballot can't happen at town meeting, and maybe there's a reason for that. It came from a petition from the voters to do it earlier. We would have had to do it here ahead to do that. To yeah, so we day. we might. I don't know if we can move the date now. Well, you can ask the attorney, but no, I don't probably not. I can. Okay, it might be something to consider for future years. It has years. to be warned. Uh, it's a, not our decision to make. It's not our decision at all. It's the it's the um, school district's decision that they have to make it at a duly warned meeting, and our next duly warned meeting is in February. So, so we we could propose that on our, our warning. But I just think that would extend the timeline for everyone, and then when you're when you're walking into this situation, you have numbers that well, are more finite. I think there's potentially mm -hmm. options um, to to deal with it, but it's not. Ch we couldn't just change the date of the meeting. I mean, there's, it's possible we could say we're not. You know, we're going to present a budget and recommend you vote it down or whatever. I think you could ask. <coughs> um, Why would we do that? Well, I'm just saying if he wants more time. If we just, yeah, if you, you, you can't just delay the meeting, mm -hmm. I don't believe. You have to come up with So if you're contacting the attorney, you might want to ask that question yeah, as well. Yeah, ask that question. That's yeah. interesting. That's a good there question. are other Is there a motion? avenues. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. No, necessary. <laughs> no. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't be just changing. Yeah, because our current timeline is you guys today. decide next Tuesday. We have to Tuesday. decide by next Tuesday, right? I know. We have one out in the audience there. Go ahead, sir. Um, speaking as a parent, and I... Um, I have to give you a little background, is that when I moved here, I moved here because of this school, not because of any other reason. I chose to come here because this school offered more than these other schools in the entire southern part of Vermont offered for my children. And so I chose this school for my kids. My concern is, is that if all of a sudden we start reducing the things that are being offered here, how many more students are going to choose to go elsewhere beyond what we're already predicting and what effect will that have on this budget in the long run are we going to have to reduce again again um, and if we keep going down this hill it's just going to get worse um, you if you keep cutting this we're going to have a school that's just a run-of-the-mill high school and there's no incentive for people to come to this school at this point we have an awful lot of really good programs here that actually are still drawing and holding students here my big concern is if we start cutting, they are going to start leaving at a higher rate than you're predicting currently. And what's going to happen to this budget when that happens? And to that end, I mean, thinking about like where we're going to be, I mean, we can plan budgets three or four years out, but until we know like educationally where we're going to be three or four years out, that can be a challenge as well. One of the challenges of doing this right now, so I'm in the chair now for I mean, not even six months, and this stuff is all being thrust upon us. Um, whatever whatever timeline I can have with staff to figure out what the school looks like in three to five years and how that translates into costs, revenue, so on and so forth. Um, and I'm not just trying to pay lips with the dance, like we just got creative and like think outside the box. Like it's, it's much more complicated than that, obviously. But, but, I, but I think that it, we don't have the choice 
right? There's going to have to be things that change. Otherwise, what, what these guys have described is potentially true for the school. It's just a downward spiral. And so we have to really think about where we want to be in those three to five years. I have already started working with staff and discussing and setting the foundation to do that work to explore that. And I think that's something that really, that's going to take a little bit of time. I'm not going to be, I mean, I can give you numbers by next Tuesday, what 300 grand means, but I can't tell you by next Tuesday where we're going to be in three years education. That I'm going to need some time for. Um, so I just want to make sure that, we, that we're clear on that point as well. I have some incredibly caring, passionate staff who are committed to, to doing what we need to do to make Leland and Greg, you know, to, to expand what's the greatness that we have, but to make it you know, you know, even better. But it's going to take some time to do that work and to think through and to talk about it and to explore. It. And then once we come up with it, if it's if it is a huge paradigm shift, then we're talking about training. And I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that go along with that. Um, so I just want to mention that because I think it's it's important to say that this developing this one year at a time thing is is highly reactionary, mm -hmm. and I understand why we have to do it. Well, the idea would be really is to respond now, react, get through what we need to get through to get a budget passed so we can operate next year, and then take from this point moving forward to really think about what that means. We talked about this last time about getting you guys involved in that process in the summer as well, or whatever mm -hmm. it looks like, to talk about where we want this this, this school to be um, so that it doesn't go away. I think that's exactly right. I think you're exactly right. That's what we need to do. We need to so get, what does that look like? Does that get mean something in place now so we can continue to operate. And then right. we absolutely have to go three, four years out, right. figure it out, look at, you know, this year, this year, this year, and and stick and come up with that plan. So somewhere in this this merger has to be part of the conversation as oh, well. Oh, I know. So we've been told. I know. I keep hearing about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Howie. Um, if we reduce the, our actual costs, and in spite of us reducing our budget, taxes go up, it's out of our hands. It's not something that the taxpayers can really blame us for. If we could go to the taxpayers and say, look, we've cut our budget. It went down. We did what we had to do. If your taxes go up, take it up with the state, because we could cut. We can't cut, you know, so my feeling is that we look at the scenarios so we can say, okay, yeah, if we go below this spending threshold, these are the drastic cuts that we don't want to make. And so we bring to the taxpayers a budget that cuts it down the middle. We reduce our budget. Yes, your taxes went up a bit, but it's out of our hands. It's not because we're spending more at this school. It's because of whatever Montpelier is doing and take it up with them. I'm willing to, to bring a, a a budget to the people that you know give that that is higher than we would like as long as it's lower than it was. Well, this the draft you have right now is not exactly. It is. So so I, you know I would like to see I'd like to see you work up something that shows what it looks like if we if we go the full package and say okay but well, we don't want to do this it's too much it's too much to cut it's not fair to the kids it's not fair to the school. And the other thing I want to bring up is something that Dan mentioned, which is grants. I would like to, I know it's it's hard when we're cutting everything back, but I would like to see a line item in our budget for PR, grant, whatever you want to call it, somebody who is actually out there searching out and writing grant proposals and creating marketing material so we can attract more kids to the school. Because really that's that's a, uh, the, the key to offering more stuff is to make the school more attractive, attract more people moving into the community. If we have a school that's attracting people to move to our community, we have a good argument to go to our taxpayers and say, hey, look, this is what it costs. Mm -hmm. so, so I know it's, ca you know it's sort of counterintuitive when we're cutting back teaching staff, but I think it's really important that we look into marketing and promotion and grant writing and actually have somebody on the payroll to do that. And, and I, the PR piece, I, I agree with you. I think that's an important thing that we need to do a better job of. The grant piece is a double-edged sword. Um, well, we're not talking about federal consolidated grant. We're talking about like private grants. I assume is what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, wherever the money um, is. Well, I mean, part of the the, part of the challenge with those things is they're often there's there's strings attached to right. the money, mm -hmm. and it's not long term. It's startup to do something that then we got to figure out if we're going to do it, and then you got to continue it. And, I mean, and, and so there's 
it's not as simple as just like we're going to dump some money into the revenue side. It, it isn't that simple. It's like there's an initiative they want you to do, which is going to cost that amount, and they're going to pay for that initiative, but it may or may not be related to where the vision of the school is. And so that's what I mean. It's, just, it's right. one of those things that I, and then they pull the strings after two years, and then you're stuck paying the bill in the third year, and you're like, eh, I didn't really want this thing in the first place. So there's a danger in that. The lure of easy money is sometimes it is too good to be true. I'm sure there's good ones, but that's. Well, again, it's, it, without having somebody really, you know, researching, right. without putting the time, you don't have, you know, there's nobody, everybody who's got a full schedule, unless it's written into somebody's job description to do this kind of work and see what's out there, it's not going to happen. <coughs> One sec. Emily? So I just wanted to address the point that Howie brought up about Montpelier um, and making the decisions. Um, the decisions of, around our budgeting and our school spending happen only at the local level. All across the state, the decisions that are made, the Ed Fund is, um, we raise the money to fill the Ed Fund based on the budgets we pass at the local level. And I think it's really important that we remember that because while we might feel good because our budget went down, it's a, it's a statewide education funding system and if um, Overall, the spending is going up, the taxes are going to go up. I mean, that's just <laughs> the way it is, and that's what's happened. So, Montpelier doesn't make the spending decisions. The spending decisions are made at a local level. No, they and set it's up a the statewide. scenario. They set right. up the scenario, these formulas that it's are cut in our budget. They wrote, the law was written in Montpelier about, these, the, about this whole, uh, you know, phantom students, the whole phantom. harmless. Right. You know, it was to help ease the process, and now it's being taken away because of the enrollment continuing to go down and the cost continuing to escalate. And so I'm just I, I just want to make sure everybody understands that the spending is decided at the local level, not at the Montpelier level. That's all. Okay. Phoebe, I think you're next. And you um, I just wanted to speak to Howie's point about grants in that um, I also previously worked in the after-school programs, and a large part of the after-school programs is looking for grants, um, so I think Thera Fuller, that is a part, <coughs> pretty actively seeking them. I know when I worked, I wrote and won like a $20,000 grant for the Wyndham Foundation, so it is happening. Um, a lot of it is sort of geared towards after school, but it, it's happening, and they're <coughs> a little bit more manageable without, you know, the strings attached and less sort of, um, connections of what they have to be used for. And I would argue that it does a lot of great things for our schools because the after school programs are, you know, offering lots of great pieces. So it is happening. Just thank you for doing it. Thank you. Patty you so just to express my what I'd like to see is um I I like to see See what the th extra three hundred thousand would look like, just <coughs> for the to realize that this is a serious situation. Um, but I would not probably be in favor of bringing that to the Jamaica people because it would probably look pretty bad. Bobby? So I don't know. Sorry, I thought you were. I uh, feel like the <coughs> best PR program we used to have were the extracurricular activities, the band, <coughs> Journey East, the drama program, which is probably one of the reasons why Dale was to come here with his family. And uh, as we reduce resources allocated to these programs, we sort of start into this feedback loop. So um, I would like to <coughs> be able to propose to, to to tell, to I would like to make sure the community knows that these hoops that we're jumping through in order to comply in a first measure and then in a future measure with these requirements put, put to us by the state are going to deeply, deeply impact the education, the quality, the staff, everything. And that uh, before we make a decision and a recommendation, we would like to know where people stand. Are they willing to pay the extra dollars? Or are we willing to take the chance to see the high school, which is, for all extent, for all purposes, the center of the community, wither away and disappear? 
because we are kind of seeing that as a worst case scenario, but it's real now. So before, I mean, it's all good and nice to see these very difficult uh, numbers that you come up with. I can only imagine how much uh, aggravation goes into coming up with these recommendations and then going back and coming up with another 100 or 200 or 300,000. But uh, before voting on anything, I would really like to get some information out there on what that really means. Go ahead. Yes, you. Yes. Um, so, as Bob was just saying, then to be able to <coughs> present to the public, um, the taxpaying public, the voting public, a, a, a couple of scenarios. The most extreme, if you have to cut six hundred thousand, and then we give us three or four scenarios. But the problem with this is we have this time crunch that next Tuesday is when you, as the board, are supposed to decide which budget to accept to be able to present to the voters who will then vote in February. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So there's not a whole lot of time. So I guess you'll check with your attorney to find out if there is a little wiggle room in time for that. But um, the publicity around it, how do we let the public know this is where we are, these are the scenarios, this is what it would mean tax-wise, um, before you just accept one of those budgets and present that between now and February there has to be a lot of discussion <coughs> and publicity to the public. Um, and then when we only have one option to vote that, that one budget um, in February, and whether it's voted up or voted down, um, I mean, whether it's approved or voted <laughs> down, it's not known if people vote it down because they don't want the cuts. In the past, historically, and I know I've asked this question before, was the board assumes that when people vote down the budget, it means that they want more reductions. But in fact, it could also mean people do not want this budget because of the drastic cuts and what it will do to the school. We have no way of knowing that. So I think to continue having a viable program, to keep students coming, to keep having families move in here, um, we need to look at what are the different scenarios and present that to the public so they can make a more informed decision. Well, that's kind of why we hold the meetings like this. Except is that so that the public will come. I and have to last, say, last week, week and I know you said that it was warned, but when I looked in the newspaper, both last Monday and last Tuesday, it was not in the newspaper. This last Tuesday's meeting was not in the Brattleboro Reformer. Um, it, Wednesday's meeting was for Act 46, but the meeting that we had last week was not in last week's newspaper. Both Monday and Tuesday, it was not in the newspaper. I, I, I pulled it out of the old newspapers okay. and looked at it. So, yes, it might be on somebody's, uh, on the post office or general store's um, place where they often post them there, but not everybody gets that opportunity. They're looking in the newspapers, one of the meetings, or just that this is what the meeting is going to discuss. We have to let the public know that the budget is going to be discussed and a little more background information to bring people out here. And now we're, we're really tight. We have a week. That's not enough time. You want to say something, Patty? Is there a particular reason why we have to do this next week and couldn't do it the next week? No. Other than it's a Christmas break. Well, it's Christmas that break, and we have a timeline to get things to printers and get it out and make our our you know our budget information meeting where we talk about what we've actually put forth and then our annual meeting um we're, we're kind of up against the timeline okay. so a couple years ago and i think you were involved this, a couple years ago the budget got voted down mm -hmm. we all remember that and and i refuse to have any of us be handcuffed by this timeline to make poor decisions for our children when there could be public who has a lot to say about it my experience two years ago i'm a new fane rep was new fane mobilized that budget got voted down and i went up and down i mean everybody i don't know if anybody voted in that but we were really engaged in getting the message out 
whether it's up or down, whatever your feelings are, this second the second budget proposal we put forward to was that three years ago? I think it was um, two. Two. It ended up passing what by one vote. Um, so I know that. Right now, we're pushed up against a wall, but I don't want us to feel disheartened that there is an opportunity for people to get engaged in this process still, even at this less. We may have to put a budget forward in next week or two weeks, quite frankly, that I'm just not going to be comfortable with. But we need to move forward from there and make better changes and better choices for our kids. And if you vote the budget down, unless somebody petitions to bring that same budget back, you have to go lower. Well, then we'll have to make those decisions. Next budget has to be I don't want to change it, but it could go up. Could. Can it go up? Is that, it, it, it has, has to, to go change. down? It has uh, to well, change. It even always said you got to do lower. So well, I, well I think we need to law, find that out. I'm not going to just. No, you have to change it, but it, it so doesn't it have be to different. necessarily go down. You well, that's could go easy. Up. Yeah. Most, most people. <laughs> yeah, the it's perception is that it's too much. I think that's smart. So, based on what I'm hearing from around the table, um, I think we'd kind of like to see the the, the worst case, um, and then go from there. So it's 301. <laughs> well, you know. Yeah. And, and if there are mitigating factors that we know of while you're developing that number, obviously take them so into account. So threshold is what you're saying. Uh, Show yeah. us it's what the threshold. As close as you can come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we need to know because we have to present this to the taxpayers. We need to tell them what the worst case scenario is. How is that exactly going to affect their kids and the school? If we don't have that information, it's kind of useless. But you might not have that you know? until next Tuesday. And that doesn't mean we're going to approve it. I certainly hope we don't have to yeah. go that far. Need to leave. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. No. So if we don't have this information to share with our taxpayers, how is that going to do you, anything? Is, are you looking for what $301,000 or threshold would be uh, in reductions, or are you looking for a new draft to include those reductions? The reason I asked the difference was if you're going to publish anything online, if we haven't ever have it done in time, do you want that being a draft that's out there, or do you want just a separate document like I gave you tonight that shows, well, in this, t this case it was both. It was in, she adjusted in the budget, and I provided an extra document, which, what, you're saying, you is it okay if we just have a budget with a list of notes and not have yeah. to rework the whole entire budget? Yeah. I think something like this yeah. is, is, this is far more the general applicable person to the actually general. just say, this is what they want to do. So can I have some direction about what you want posted on the website? Do you want draft one? Version one. Version, version two, two. And then to show the date, what we've done. Put the date on. Okay. And then post post the budget rationales once I yeah, you're next all those. Yeah. And post the rationales with each. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then information about the next meeting. And have something that <coughs> that's on the landing page, the home page, that either is a link or something. Okay. So it's You're really after easy for people to get to. Can I, sorry. <laughs> Can I ask for a clarification just to make Certainly. sure. Certainly. So you like this format, <laughs> but we don't have to go and change the entire budget. No. But we should indicate on this page where in the budget. Which line? Yeah, yeah. Right? I agree. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? But it, the, the budget will not show that reduction. There won't be a version four budget. You're just going to we'll see where We'll just plug those numbers into three. This version okay. and then your notes. Yep. Got it. Okay. Um, Al. So are you also looking at the 130, which would be the 3.5% uh, equalized people? Based on what the attorney, based on what the attorney says, sure. I mean, that I, if there's any mitigating factors at all, equalized pupils go up. Uh, they find out what the exemptions are going to be and plug those in. Anything we, we can do to change that, you know, I emailed Chris. go close to the threshold. I emailed Chris the uh, you were next. Um, <coughs> excuse me. This may be like a very elementary question. Um, so just from the process standpoint, so you're expecting or hoping that Bob will come back in uh, a week from tonight with a second 
round of a budget proposal with 300,000 more cut, right? So that happens next Tuesday. At that meeting, do you all then choose which budget you like better, the one with 600,000 cut or the one with 300,000 cut? Is that the process? Or somewhere in between. between, and that's the budget. And then from there, that goes to the voting <coughs> in February. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about. I <laughs> try to think of a way to put this where it's um, politically correct. <laughs> For that to happen a week from tonight with no input from the general public, to me, it just it sounds completely unreasonable. I can't imagine, uh, I have a community, really close-knit community of friends who we all have really little children in the elementary schools around here. They have no idea what's happening at Leland and Gray with, in terms of the budget. Um, I don't, you know, chat it up with them about budget cuts and things like that. Um, if they then found out that they had no say or you know, were able to come to any of these meetings and hear about any of this, and that it was just kind of left up to this group to decide within one week. It just feels, it is very unsettling and it doesn't, it doesn't feel good for what it's worth. Um, trying to get the word out to the public between now and next Tuesday so they know to come here so they can hear what what is it going to look like for him to cut three hundred thousand more dollars? What is that going to do to our school? Are, really? <laughs> I I just think that what I guess it's up to us then as the teachers to tell everybody who has children and care about this building to come here next Tuesday and witness what's going to happen. It's up to us too to inform yeah. we're the representatives to our towns and it's up to us to inform our towns by whatever means we have available to tell them how important it is to contact your 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 person and let them know how you feel or be at the meeting yeah. so that's how that's one of our like responsibilities you, you, so you're you. spot on you're thinking oh, is spot yeah. on you're, you're yeah. right. you're, totally you're right. Right. I, I totally it doesn't get it. feel any better on the side of the table Really? I am sure it doesn't. It just it's it's asinine to think that in one week we're gonna say there's those six hundred thousand dollars off your school budget right. and so, programs and yeah. 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 So Emily was next, and then we go out to the audience. So I would suggest um, that since we have a timeline we've got to deal with that we know of right now, because we have a thirty to forty day warning period, we have to meet no matter what. So I would suggest that we submit a press release um, as quickly as we possibly can and try to make sure that we get um, the information out there as best we can, put it on Front Porch Forum, whatever, and, and explain that, that we have found this is the, the challenge that we're dealing with and encourage people to come to give us feedback. And if they can't come, they could email and mm -hmm. show them how to do that. Yeah. We need a press release. Not a bad and idea. There are ways ways to to everywhere to do it. I got you in the vest in the back. Yeah. Sorry, I don't remember. Okay, Dale here. first, then Phoebe, then John. Um, first, I'd like to just thank you guys for this incredibly hard job that you're doing. And I am quite familiar with this situation. I have, in my career, I have watched four airlines go down the tubes doing exactly what we're trying to do here. We keep trying to cut. And what happened with the airlines is even eventually you reach a critical mass where people start saying, I can't give back anymore. We went to the, watch the unions give back 50% of what they were making, uh, cut back on services to our uh, paying public. Uh, you just keep cutting and cutting and cutting. And all of a sudden what happens is you can't go back. There's no returning to where you left. And you end up getting swallowed up by somebody else who had a better plan. I think what the what happened was is in the end we ended up becoming the largest airline in the world and it, it was done because in the process of all this cutting we reorganized and made it a different airline than what the old model was 
And I think maybe what's going to have to happen here is maybe we re need to redesign the way we're doing things here without all of the draconian cuts and, and the, uh, I would say, negative thinking of going down rather than just trying to hold our own for a while until we get some breathing room and figure out exactly where we want to go. Um, I'm just saying that it's, it's a dangerous path to go down because once you start going down it, other things you don't see today start happening. So people start bailing because they, you know, I can't do this anymore, and they start leaving. And pretty soon, you don't have any teachers left, and then where are you going to be? Uh, I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen. I'd hate to see that happen, but <coughs> the reality is, is you know, you got to. Everybody has to live here, and if there's nothing left, then what are you going to do? So I know it's a tough decision. I mean, it's very hard, but it, it's got to be. I think once the public understands what we're up against, I think they might be mm -hmm. a little more forgiving than you think. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I agree. maybe. But they need to know. But they need to know, yes. And I that's agree. it. Yeah. We need to see. All right, so I maybe. just have sort of a logistical clarification around the budgets and what's going to be published online, et cetera. Is, so are you asking, so Bob's going to go back to the drawing board and cut another 300 and some. Are you suggesting that that be published online with his outline of what is going to be cut? Because my concern of that would be that may or may not happen, and that's people's jobs and people's things that's like being broadcasted of like, this online. might happen, but it might not. And I have concerns of that yeah. being put online. Until we well, do it, it shouldn't I, be online. I do think the budget should be available online, um, but something like a prospective budget that is like the bare bones major cutting, I would have concerns about that being posted online. Yeah. Especially through. since it may not actually go through. We've never right. posted one until we've seen it as a board. Yeah. I agree with your concerns, and I don't, but how do we get across to the public? That Press release. Look, we, we, we get the information we have next week. We make the decision we make, and then based on that, everything goes online, and we say, this is the decision we had to make. You get to vote this down, but here's the other situation that we could have been faced with. And we get to make the decision next week how we can okay. move forward with that. Yeah, so nothing goes online until we get it. And, and this probably goes without saying, but every time there's an individual who is potentially impacted or a department that's impacted, I'm meeting with those people face to face. Thank you. Good. I've done Thank that you. this past week. I've done it with the full staff, so they understood what's going on, and I'll continue to do that. Okay. Um, so okay. just so you guys know that no one's going to be outed here on <laughs> in a board meeting without knowing first that, that there's a potential. And even though it may not be realized that they ought to know that it's going to be talked about. Right. Okay. John? Um, how long has the administration and the board known of this 600000 Today. Today? Today? At Today. three o'clock? Uh, yeah. At three? Oh, yeah. three hours. Well, 300 of it. Yeah. 300 yeah. of it we knew last week. 300 of it last week. 300 of it last week and the other 300 earlier. So, so why is it just being discovered now? The state. Equalized pupil count. It's not, it's just, I feel like it's the, the process. <laughs> wow. It's the timeline of the budget process. It happens this way every year. The administration well, no, is going to take this process on at this point and bring it out. Use this as an example of of mismanagement somewhere along the line. Is that right? I'm just catching on to this. Is this mismanagement of public funds and? and what, what, do you, what would you call this? This is a timeline that's been in place for many, many years. The reason it's becoming a bigger issue for us now is because the numbers are challenging. We haven't had them like this before. No. So, I mean, this Wasn't is this a, an opportunity to bring it out? So we really talked, make it, let Leland and Gray become a, 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 the, 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 you know, the forefront of the problems? So we've talked in the past about moving our meeting from February to March. We've said that several times before. We've never followed through on it. That would help. Would take some of the timeline pressure off. We're in the tightest crunch of any mo most school districts in the state because we vote early. I, and I just if don't we understand early, why traditionally. you just heard about it today or yesterday or the day before. Can I answer that? I don't, I don't understand that. Well, it's really about the equalized pupil count coming out. That's that's why we just heard about it Comes now. Every year. But but really, the past of 
equalize students going down a little bit each year, but the budget not really going down in relation to that. Now all of a sudden, you're at a point where there's this 20 student drop in equalized pupil because of the Act 46 law and the phasing out of the 3.5, the way they're interpreting it right now, or I'm interpreting it right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's a cumulative effect, really. But as far as knowing about that extra 300,000, that was literally today. How it was next. And then John, I just want to say the, it's happening like this because school funding in Vermont is like a Rube Goldberg contraption. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is no way of, of knowing. I mean, I've been on these school boards for 15 years, and every year it gets more complicated and more hard to understand. The, the, the relationship between the number of pupils, the equalized pupils, the tax rate, the common level of appraisal, every one of these pieces is part of our budget considerations. And a lot of these pieces don't come down from the state until the last minute in terms of how, what other, you know, what we get per student is dependent upon what other districts are spending. And how it all works is, it, takes a CPA to really understand. Um, so really all we can do here is we can control our budget, which, you know, is what we're doing. Well, it's, it seems to me that this is an opportunity for Leland and Gray, this is an educational facility, to get this out and get it out in a big way. Because this is happening all over. It's not just happening here. It, that is absolutely correct. So this, to me, this is an opportunity <coughs> to do something a little bit larger than just Leland and Gray and Townsend. Get it out there. There were actually school districts that dropped 20 percent in their equalized pupil this year. So it, you know, it's, it's actually the wrong direction to start dropping programs. This is the wrong time to be doing that. It's been said in a lot of different ways tonight. But the kids today need as much help as they can possibly get. And it looks to me like you, the, the, the board's kind of jumping ship on what the hell they're supposed to be doing here. Well, and I don't mind being quoted on any of this. No, we, we, we're trying to maintain the program as best we can. We have, but we still have to maintain staff levels in line with the number of people. Otherwise, the voters won't go for it. All right. Yeah, yes, yeah, I see you. Like, can I not? <laughs> Dan was actually had his hand up ahead of you. Oh. <laughs> okay, uh, just a quick. Oh, go ahead. You go ahead first. Well, I, I just want to say, I, you know, I I want to support what the the board has done for the last three, four months, and I I completely agree. How this is done is completely asinine in terms mm -hmm. of getting the equalized pupils at the you know the eleventh hour. Uh, that should happen in July. I mean, we, we build budgets mm -hmm. the completely the wrong way. That's the number that you need to start with. Here's where I need to build it out from. Here's where the equalized people is. And now I can build a responsible budget around that and start looking at if there is any potential impact on programs and all that. Uh, so yeah, this is an incredibly difficult situation uh, to be put in as the 11th hour. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get pay pay orders. Yeah, Dan. Dan. So so we just learned a moment ago. Um, Emily said that you know this is this is how the budget operates. This is the timeline that we have. This is what we've given. So you're telling us that this is just the way it is. We find out Not seven days saying. before the finalized budget has to be that we got to drop another three hundred thousand dollars. So we can't publicize that drop until we actually see what those numbers are, which we won't see till next Tuesday night. So next Tuesday night, all in one time, we're going to drop the information of this is the money we're going to we're gonna have to further cut, perhaps, and then we're going to make a decision on it. And we're not, by just by the way of the timeline, we're not going to be able to really involve the public at all, um, other than whoever might be able to show up next week. And, and you really, you can choose to follow that, or you can also say, no, we're not going to do this because this does not make sense. We're going to petition to say, and we're going to change the date of our budget vote. And we're going to do that now. We're going to we're going to change the date. We're going to legally warn it, and we're going to change that date because we want to involve the public. If if you have just your budget in its 
you know, typical budget opacity, which is what budget seems to be. Nobody's going to mm -hmm. look at that and be able to glean anything out of it. The, the information that Bob gave you tonight, here's what $300,000 in cuts looks like. That's something that people can understand. You know, and I take P Phoebe's point. It's like, you know, we're, we're, we're telling the people, you know, you might lose your job. Nobody likes to sort of have that out in public. But on the other hand, if people don't really understand what we're going to be talking about next week, which is maybe $600,000 in cuts, and what those cuts mean, then you're not giving them information. And then, then all the other information they have to do, vote on, is your final budget. You, you would be so much better served if the public could really give you, you know, you might be amazed at the people who come in here and say, just spend the dang money. Or I might be amazed at the people that come in and say, get rid of these idiot teachers and shut this place up. But you won't know if the budget process, by virtue of its own timeline, doesn't even allow that to happen. That's insanity. And so you Dan, don't have to just go along with it. You do not. We do not always have to go along with the way things have been done. So Dan, that was why we directed the administration to go look at, at when they contact the attorney to find out what another scenario is. Now, when we are asking for an additional $300,000 um, cut to, to look at, that's probably not going to be done until the time we meet, I would assume it's going to take. Yeah, 6.30 of the night. So, I mean, being able to public, it, it, we, we can't change the situation no. we're in now. All we can do yeah, is change the situation moving we're forward. Okay. So let me just finish. The situation now is that we've asked for another um, draft uh, and a modified one at that <coughs> point, and we're probably going to get that that day when we, so we won't be able to publish that, but we've said we're going to do a press release and we're going to contact an attorney to see if there's a way to change the timeline. This is a surprise for all of us too. This timeline is the same one that we are on every year. It doesn't mean that it, it's necessarily going to have to be followed this year. We're looking into whether it is or it isn't. It's not like we're giving in to this. We don't want to do this either. We don't want to be in this place. We would really like to not be in this place. But the fact is that we're probably going to be in this place next year too. So we need to be open and honest about that. And I, I want to make sure we are doing that. So, so let's look at what we're doing <coughs> this year. Gerald. So what would it take to change the voting process? I know we are doing Australian ballot and there was reasons in the town accepted to do it this way, but I remember years past <coughs> it was a floor vote and the auditory, the, the gymnasium was packed with people and there was hours of discussion and debate and then and there was since, <coughs> since the vote was changed to Australian ballot by a petition of the voters. Right. The board has taken the position that we will change it, that we would entertain changing it back again based on a petition from right. the voting public. Mm -hmm. So please, right. start because a petition. Asked yeah. We've number, asked for that at our last four it. meetings. We've asked for we've a asked petition for and we have meeting. not gotten a petition yet. So yeah. obviously people are happy okay. enough with Australian ballot that there's no petition forthcoming. But that's still but a year. For the, and that I would be not for this year, that would be for next year. Right. So my second question, Nolan, <laughs> how, soon are, how soon is this video up on your station to be able to be viewed by the public? Usually right. a day after. The day after. The day after. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. So in the, in the press release, I know last week we did not have uh, minutes taken, so there's nothing to refer to on the online for the website, um, the schools, the superintendent, uh, supervisory union's website for those minutes. But clearly there will be this week, and so in your press release, have people refer to the um, BCTV so they can hear some of this discussion even. Um, I would also encourage anybody that's here along those lines to communicate this link to anybody on social media that you're yeah. involved with. It's something I've done just through Facebook and you can really get a lot of people either engaged or at least interested in what's going on. Go crazy with Facebook and stuff. That's what I do in Jamaica. <laughs> and if you have time to make any phone calls. Or go up and down your street. And if you're out at the post office the store or you see anybody tell yeah. them. <coughs> Go up to them, tell them. Yeah. Bill. Tell you uh, your town. I just want to clarify. Okay. Am I responsible for the press release? Is that everybody's assumption that you want me to? Oh, no, chair is. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I will help you. I'll okay. <laughs> I will. Yeah. Bill, based on that, yes, you're responsible. Patty will. Well, well, no, no, I'm not. A, my husband 
It needs to be. He's a writer. And what's Accurate. the timeline? So you're gonna have you know, Let's talk about it tomorrow. Let's talk about what we can put in the press release tomorrow, and obviously we need to, you know, talk about what's what's happening and um, sort of what the direction was tonight, and and that you know, based on our timeline, we're really pressed to make a decision next week. So, you know, speak now or. What? Can I ask? Sure. While you're speaking to the attorney. Yes. Um, you've got you've got two questions, I guess. Section already. twenty-two and section twenty-three and the meeting. And the meeting. So I would also, um, you, w what you're asking about is, can we delay our right. our delay. vote on our budget? But I would also ask the process that we need to go through if we decide that we want to move our meeting to later in the year permanently, because we can warn that um, when we when we war do our annual meeting warning, we can add an article on there to say we would like. This is something that I've been hoping we would do for a number of years, and no one seemed to be too interested in doing it. But maybe we could do it at the end of March, or we could do it at town meeting, or whatever. It'll be harder at town meeting if we don't go Australian ballot. So you know, those are the questions that need to be asked sure. of an attorney. What's the process we go through to move our budget approval process to March, or even April if we chose? I mean, and what, what consequence is the scenario? we may face if we do? Right. I I don't think we should do it at town meeting or after town meeting because elementary school budgets are at that time and I think that it's important for everybody to know what this deal is. So that's part of the question to ask. Yeah. And the other thing is um, around the merger, it, it, how much the merger will impact this. If there is, if there's going to be a vote on a merger, yeah. this may be a, you know, if, it, if a merger passes, this might be a moot point. So I guess what I'm saying. There'll be a different date. Sure. One vote, right? Okay. For K twelve, on town meeting day, probably, Pro probably. right? Day. Depending on yeah. Joe, could I say one more? Shortly. Um, I am new to this job. I've been this gig <laughs> for five months, uh, but I, this is incredibly valuable and important. Um, it, working with uh, people of the caliber of Bob and Lori, and working through this process and thinking through it on a long term. Uh, sustainable, uh, community-based. Uh, I think you all mentioned it being a, uh, the school being a magnet for families and really being uh, the heartbeat of our area. Um, we're a new team that is working with some really talented people and there's real opportunity here. I know it feels really, really challenging and it, and it can be, but facing reality is kind of the first step of saying what are we going to do? And, um, you know, just coming tonight and sharing your thoughts and, uh, you know, the energy that you have, I mean, we can, we can create anything we want here, <laughs> you know? It's up to us. And we need to make the argument for the investment and we need to listen to the students and we need to think to the future. But um, the control's really in our hands. And maybe I'm being really naive, but I think the talent exists here to make anything we want to have happen. We just have to do the work and we're just beginning the work and I think this might be the most difficult time because we got to face the reality before we can move forward but um, it, it's really quite positive. I know it's scary but we're being honest and um, we're being authentic and I think that's the beginning so I just I think it's important to, to mark that moment. Tiny yes. little shameless plug to piggyback on that. You guys are talking about this press release that you're going to put together, and I have just sent a press release about community service, which is finally happening at Leland and Gray, and will be interesting that it's going to be in pretty much the same papers about the budget as that community service is now officially on the table. So thank you for your support in that. Another positive note of things we're doing. All right. So you know you know where we're going with the budget, right? <laughs> <laughs> We've worked that all out now. Talking, talking to me? Yeah. No. Do you have enough? You have enough I direction to go back and, and for, for do what you need to do. Yeah. Okay. But it wasn't a number. It was yeah. under the threshold. 
Right. Okay. Which may, meeting that target. target may change. I'm going to start exactly. with 301 right. and we'll see okay. what magic or conjures up. And it's not a whole new draft, right? It's just, yes. it's just the list. Just list. It's just right. the list. And we're going to see okay. potential impact on property taxes. As much as we can. Yeah, as much as we can. As close as I can get it. <laughs> yep. Okay. So, given that it's 930, how much of the rest of the, uh, you have to, please. We need this. Yeah. Yes. So I was going to suggest that the two items, or several items on my report, we can table again. On the back side of the list of reductions is my report for the month. So we can read that or. And we have your report. You have my um, report. Thank you. The proficiency based graduation presentation. Oh, don't leave. This is the good news part of the night. <laughs> we'll, we'll put that off. This is the one little bright spot we get. <laughs> so and I think this, this, and I don't know, but it must want to have Dom, yeah, Dom present as well. While he's here, I want to make sure we're not leaving out the student yeah. presentation. Yeah, yeah, let Dominic yeah. present, but yeah. give us the good news. So let me give you this first. So um, we received this uh, on the uh, last, beginning of this week, uh, I guess, or end of last week. That there are there's this thing that the AOE does called Vermont Presidential Scholars, um, and the awards are given for outstanding leadership and service to the communities, um, and there are ten of these given out in the entire state. All right, two of them of the ten are going to Leland and Gray seniors. Amazing. Yes. <laughs> One of them may share my last name. Uh, <laughs> Caleb Tebow and Caroline Teets. That's so really great. incredible. That's awesome. Um, Saw that in my yeah, really cool. Time. So, uh, of course, I'll be up there with them at the State House on January 9th for a reception. January 9th? Because the date was wrong somewhere. I knew it had to be wrong. It was on Facebook or something. And so it's the 9th. This says Monday the 9th at 4.30 p.m. Excellent. So, anyways, very proud Congratulations of them. Congratulations to them. Really great. Two of the 10, 20% of the winners are in our little budget late in school, so that was very cool. <coughs> Dominic, I know you have a report that's buried in this stuff here. But go ahead, the floor is yours. So, first, the basketball season has started. The tryouts and all three games starting in December. You can find the full schedule on the Way Undergrad website. Uh, the Project Feed Thousands campaign kicked off with, a, with an assembly. We had guest speakers of Joe and uh, George Haynes, who was one of the co-founders of Project Feed. Uh, I talked to Ms. Landenberger, and she didn't have a certain number of how much we've donated, but she said it's just as good or better than last year, and the NHS will be taking it all over to the Townsend Food Shelf on Monday. Uh, I have that the 10th grade class put on a high school semi-formal on December 3rd. And the players usually do hats off first, but they were already getting ready and prepared for Dracula, their last show this year. Cool. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Dom? <coughs> How's the basketball team doing? Do we know? Middle school girls started today. And, and, <laughs> they started practicing, you mean, or they started? We had our first game this evening. And, and? Uh, it was not victorious, <laughs> but the boys won. It was 50-50. Right. Okay, <laughs> take that. I don't that. Really know how much we lost, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have room for improvement. Did they have fun? <laughs> <laughs> they did have fun, and they fought the entire game, even though they scored two points. All right. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, so old business Act Forty Six. I there's not a lot to tell you. Um, it's in process. The I guess on the twentieth, um, we're presenting the articles to the agency of education, uh, board of state, education? Board of state, state board of education, um, and we'll keep you. Our next meeting is January fourth, yep. and at that point, we're going to put together a timeline for all the public outreach that's involved before that goes to a vote. Sabbatical request kind of came off the table based on budgetary things. Well, I think you'll still need to, there's, the requests are still there. Okay. So the board will need to make a determination about those at some point. You okay. have enough time, but you'll just have to act on it. 
Okay. Um, we have bills and pay orders that were handed to me. They're all reviewed and everything's correct? Yes. Okay. So we have, we have uh, three general fund warrants in the amount of $192,928.31 and two... I'll, I'll give you the sheet, Peter. And two payrolls in the amount of $262,079.93 for a grand total of $455,008.24. Need a motion to approve those? So moved. Second. Who moved? Who moved? Who seconded? Drew moved. Twyla, Twyla seconded. Twyla seconded. All right. Any discussion on any of that? All right, all in favor of approving them, please say aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions, beautiful. Um, the minutes for the consent agenda, we need to pull the 12, 6, 16 minutes, because I actually took those, but I have not typed them up and distributed them. them yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they do exist. <clears throat> so we need to pull those out of there, because I need to distribute them, and I'm, I'm woefully behind. But we can um, approve the minutes of the 8th. So we just need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion to approve minutes of, no of November 8th. We're just, okay. Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of November 8th, 2016. Uh, any discussion on that? Two additions. If I wasn't here, do I abstain? No, you, don't need to. No, you can abstain. Um, no discussion? All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstentions? Good. Do we have anything? I moved it and I did. Twyla seconded. Anything else we need to talk about tonight? I have one thing, and it's just based on a poster that I saw in the hallway that there is a winter concert and art show on this Thursday, December 15th. The art show starts at 6.30 and the concert at 7. So come support the band and the All art right. department. It's in the gym. So and it's day super day. great. This Thursday. Thursday. This Thursday. Okay. The next meetings are on there. Except it's not. Except, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Our, next <meeting> <laughs> Our next meeting is next Tuesday, 20th. the 20th. December 20th. At seven o'clock, Joe and right I will here. be coming back from Montpelier. I will be in Jamaica, so I won't be here with the team. You won't be here. Drew and I won't be here. Lori and Bob will be here. Well, I will be here and as Bob. long as we make it back in time. We make it back. Um, and the rest of the meetings are there. The Act Forty Six instead of TBD is right? January fourth. We're on at like two. I thought you were on a little. We're in the there. second session. Oh. Yeah, we're in, the, we're in the after lunch session, and then, and then there's three. I, I, might, I might have looked at something else. All right, so that's it. See you in a week. All right, second. second. <laughs> All in favor, please say aye. All right. aye. I will write some of your board meetings, but I'll try to get here after my board meeting.